Dear God, thank you for this day and thank you for what we're getting ready to learn and hear this morning. And we ask that you be with each of us as we open up our minds to what we're going to hear and how we can apply it in our daily lives. Thank you for everything you've done for us. In your name I pray, amen. I did want to say something about yesterday. My daughter's not here today because she went and did the community service today. But um, anyway, as a mother of a 15-year-old, it's a big deal to have your child up here doing that. And um, a lady came up yesterday and asked me yesterday, what are you doing to get her to be up there like that? I want my kids to turn out like that. And I want to say it's not me. It's God doing that in her. But I want to put a plug in for Christian education because I think that that's probably the key factor in why she feels like she can get up and do that and not feel fear. She does go to Georgia Cumberland Academy and she mentioned that she took this semester out and went to Ozark. And I will say she went through a very traumatizing event and I don't need to explain all the details of that. But she did and that's what made her go to Ozark for the semester. But those issues that made that happen are gone and she feels like it's safe enough to go back to GCA and where she feels like it's home. But I want to explain something about GCA because I'm, we're here on this academy campus and our kids are incredibly important and their future in our church is important. And so this is why I just want to say what I'm saying. I feel like the difference when she, I, I have not been here to see what church is like and how the kids are interacting with the church. But that's what I think is the unique thing about GCA is that the church is on the campus just like this and it's there for those kids. Their mission is for the 14 to 18 year olds. So every week, those kids are responsible for everything except the sermon. Every week, they do the praise songs, they do the, the special music, they do children's story, and sometimes they even do the sermon. But the, on, when it's not during the church service, they're still active in the church. They're responsible for weeding the flower beds around the church, they make all the bulletin boards, they make the bulletins and have to do the folding and all of that. My daughter was employed by the church and she had to make the bulletins and that kind of thing, but she also did their website. She made sure the janitors were cleaning the bathrooms. She can't go into a church now and, and when she sees toilet paper or paper on the floor, she's like, who's in charge here? This is messy. So she's taken ownership of that. But the best thing I think that they've done is they put kids on their church board. Half of their church board are students. Half. The other half are the adult members of the church. And when it comes down to voting, the kids vote. And if they're tied, the kids win every time. And they gave me an example of that when they were trying to choose the paint colors for the church. The adults wanted a darker color, the kids wanted the lighter shade, and it was 50-50. And they went with the kids. I think it sends the message to them that you're important now, not we're trying to grow you for some future role. You're important right now. And so I think that's why my child can get up in front and not be afraid because that's just, it's considered a norm there for them to do that. So I don't know what the atmosphere is like here, but I encourage you to kind of consider going that way and making it for the, our kids. I think once I became a mother, that became my ultimate job, to raise her to love God. And when you have church members and all of these people embracing her and helping her grow along the way, it's a win-win. So anyway, that's a kind of a aside from what I'm talking about today. Today we're going to be talking about Esther. But I wanted to talk back before Esther, a hundred years, because I think you need the context of what's happening during Esther's time. So a hundred years prior to Esther arriving on the scene, there was Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was in charge and this is the time of Daniel. This is when his three friends were thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down and worship the king. Um, this is when Daniel was reading the writing on the wall and interpreting the king's dreams. All during that time, they were considered foreigners in that country during that time. Eventually, years later, Babylon was overthrown and Cyrus, King Cyrus took over. And he took over, it became all the way from part of Ethiopia, all the way over to part of India. We are talking about a large area. This is Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, all of that, plus a part of India and, and part of Africa too. So this is a very large area that this man is in charge of. 
King Cyrus was different. He didn't mind having foreigners in his country and he treated them with respect. And I think we can learn a lot today from King Cyrus because we have a lot of dissension in our own country right now. There's a lot between ethnicities, between different, um, just different churches, all kinds of things. And I think the message needs to be, we can live with each other in harmony whether we agree with each other. And that's the message that King Cyrus sent 100 years prior to Esther. So during that time, he allowed the foreigners to stay. He said, you can stay if you want to, but if you want to go back to your home country, you can do that too. A lot of people stayed, and I would have to guess that's because he treated them so respectfully that they felt wanted in that country. So they stayed. And this is including the Benjamites and the um, people from Judah as well, tribes of Judah. So they were there. So 100 years later, here we are. Okay, so during this time, King Ahasuerus, and I have a hard time saying his name, I'm gonna struggle over it all day, but he became king. Three years into him being a king, he decided to throw a big party, and it was six months long. And in his kingdom, they had 127 provinces, provinces from Ethiopia to India. He invited all of his officials from all of those provinces to come and celebrate with him, and they rotated out. We're talking thousands of miles of country, so they couldn't all come at the same time. They couldn't all party together. They came in shifts, but the king partied with them all. He went on for six months, and by the end of the six months, he had a, th a one week major party to end it all. He had so much wine and all of these things that made him intoxicated and made him able to, unable to think rational thoughts. And he wanted his queen to come and dance before all of those men, and you know, he wanted her to just wear her crown. Well, she wasn't intoxicated. She hadn't been partying along with them, and she didn't want to do that. In 2016, she wouldn't have to. He'd probably get charged with harassment and something, and, and she'd win. But that was not, it's not 2016, that was 500 BC. So he didn't like that. She was kind of, she's like, I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. I don't want to be in front of all those men that way. I don't want to show myself that way. I have dignity and, and respect of myself. He didn't like that. So he thought, well, what can I do about this? We cannot have her saying no. This is going to teach all the women in, the, in, the, <laughs> in our country that they can tell their husbands no. She's not going to get away with this. So his advisor said, well, what you need to do is tell her that she's no longer going to be queen and that she can no longer see you again because we need to make sure our women know that they're going to be respectful to their men. So that's what he did. Well, then his hangover went away. And then he realized what he had done, and he wished he hadn't, because he missed Vashti. But the, once he makes a decree, it's done. You can't undo it. So he's like, what am I going to do? I'm kind of lonely. So his workers decided, well, let's, let's just hold a Miss Persia contest. And each of the 127 provinces had a Miss per their, their own little city had their contest. It's just like we do today. Each of our little cities holds their contest. Whoever wins gets to go to state. Whoever wins that gets to go to the nationals. That's kind of how they did it there. So they had at least 127 contestants coming and they went to the palace. I need water, this is a second. So along comes Hadassah into this picture. Um, Hadassah was a Benjamite. And she had been living with her, uh, they call him uncle in some places, and other places he's called a second cousin. And we don't know what, uh, what exactly happened to her real parents. Some people speculate that her dad died right before she was born and that her mom died during childbirth. We don't know. But something happened that left her orphaned. And her second cousin took her in. And his name, obviously, I think y'all will remember, is Mordecai. So he took her in and raised her. Well, this beauty contest comes along and he puts her in it. And she does quite well. She gets to move on to where all the girls are invited to the palace to compete. Now, before they compete, they spent a year getting ready. They spent six months doing exercises and eating the right diet. Then they spent another six months making sure that they knew how to, how to walk, how to do their hair, how to put on the makeup and all the perfumes and all of these things. They taught them how to behave like a queen, how to wave. Maybe it's like that, I don't know. 
we won't know. <laughs> but that's what they spent six months, I mean, an extra six months doing. So it's a whole year. And you think, well, why on earth did it take a year to prepare these women for this role? They really weren't women. He wanted virgins. He wanted young girls. They estimate Esther was about 13 when she arrived at the palace. My daughter's 15. So I have a, I don't know, I have a little personal issue with bringing him to the palace to, to walk in front of a king that's behaved like he has with Vashti. Because that's basically, you're setting her up to be with that man. So Esther is 13. And by 14 years old, she's ready for the pageant. And she had found favor with the man who was in charge of controlling the pageant. His name was Haggai. And during that year, he made sure she had the best help. She got seven helpers just for her to help her get ready, to help her do her hair, to help her exercise, to make sure she ate the right things. And on that day, they helped her get ready for this pageant. All the girls are paraded through, and the king is the only judge. When Esther got through, he liked her on the spot, and she was chosen right there on the spot. 14 years old, gonna be a queen. That's a big thing for those of you who are mothers and know what 14-year-olds are like. That is a huge weight on their shoulders. I cannot imagine subjecting my child to that. Um, okay, my computer died. That's okay, I'll just keep going. Um, anyway, so here we are, Esther has been chosen. They don't know that Esther's a Jew. She didn't tell them that. They didn't ask though either. And her, her cousin Mordecai, I told her don't tell them. We are gonna change your name to Esther from Hadassah because we wanna protect your your secret of who you really are. But they didn't ask and she didn't tell and it just kind of brings a whole new meaning to don't ask, don't tell. She didn't and I, I like that the Bible describes it this way because she didn't lie about it. She just didn't say it. They didn't ask her. So she didn't have to lie about it. So they don't know that she's a Jew. So here she gets into the into the role of queen and they are celebrating her around the whole every province is celebrating her inauguration as queen so then with um i'm losing my train of thought without my computer do y'all mind if i just get this on all right that will help me i don't want to read my notes to you but i just want to make sure i don't miss anything either all right okay I was explaining that she had not told them that she was a Jew, but she also didn't tell them her connection with Mordecai. He kind of kept a, a, he stayed in the background of it because he didn't want them to realize, well, maybe they're related. So once she became queen, she talked to the king and he's like, and said, you know, my, this Mordecai, he's got quite a, um, a resume. Look at what he can do. And so Mordecai was hired on as um, one of the king's employees who worked at the king's gate. This allowed him to be there without looking conspicuous, like I'm, I'm just peering in and trying to figure out what's going on. He was allowed to be there. And this is an important part of the story. This is a part of the story that I hadn't really caught on to until I started preparing for this. And it doesn't seem like that big of a deal but as he had that role standing there at the king's gate, he overheard two of the king's men talking about a plot to assassinate the king. I was like, okay, whatever. You know, is this a big deal? It ends up being a big deal. He tells Esther, and Esther tells the king, and they find out that the plot is true, and those two men are, are hanged. This gave honor to, uh, to Mordecai. The king had a great respect for Mordecai because of that. He saved his life. So that's where it became a big deal. Okay, so several years, they say it's about three years later that the king promoted Haman as the prime minister of all of these provinces. He had a lot of respect for Haman and he wanted everyone in all of these provinces to bow down to him every time they saw him. And everyone did except for Mordecai. And more, um, Haman didn't like that. He thought, well, that's just disrespectful to me. However, he knew the connection between Mordecai and the king and that Mordecai had saved his life. And so he thought, well, I can't just go to the king and say, hey, you know, that Mordecai out there, he's not bowing down to me. Can we get rid of him? Because he knew the answer would be no. So Haman was smart and he said, you know, there's a group of people out there that are so disrespectful. They are not bowing down to me like you have put in the decree that they're supposed to do. I think that we should do something about it. 
and the advisors all got together and they decided that they were going to have a one-day genocide of all the Jewish people. And they sealed that with the king's ring and it became a law. And they, they figured that let's do it on the, in the last month of the year. So they had a little bit of time. You had to get that message out to all 127 provinces from Ethiopia to India. This is not like today where you can just call people or text them and tell them. So it, it had to take months to get that word out as far as it needed to go. Well, Mordecai found out about the decree and he went into mourning about that. He tore his clothes, he put ashes on his head, and he was in mourning about that and very worried about all of that. So he wanted to get a message to Esther. Well, I mean, he can't just go right on into the palace, so he sent a message along with one of the workers, and the workers showed the decree to Esther. It's like, look, your, your people are, they're gonna be killed because of this. Well, of course it's alarming to her, but she's like, are you, and Mordecai is telling her, you, you need to do something about this. And she's probably thinking, are you crazy? You cannot just go into the king and say, hey, you know, can, can you stop this, please? You're going to be killing me along with all of my people. She's like, you're crazy. You're insane. If he doesn't allow, if he doesn't invite me in once he sees me, I'm going to die. And he's like, the worst part about all of this, he hasn't asked to see me in over 30 days. So what makes me think that he's going to just say, come right on in? So she sent that message back to Mordecai. And he's like, you need to tell her she's got to do this. Because just because she's queen doesn't mean that she's not going to be one of those ones that's not included. She's included. She's a Jewish person. So she, you know, you tell her, this means her too. So that message was sent back to her. And it, the part of the message that I like the most is that um, when he t the message that he sent back to her was that if you don't do it, we're going to die. But if you do do it, maybe there's a chance we'll live. And if you don't do it and we live because something else happened to save our lives, it's going to put disrespect on your family for the rest of your lives. And you're going to perish because of it. He's like, maybe, and this is Esther 4.14, another one of my new favorite texts, maybe you were brought into the world for such a time as this. That, that's just, that, that speaks volumes to me. Maybe you were brought into the world for such a time as this. Esther was 14 when she became queen. She's probably around 19 now. That's a big weight to put on this woman's shoulders. That's huge. So she sent a message back to him and said, I'll do it. But I won't do it for three days. I need everybody to fast and pray and think about you know, what the, the meaning of this is. This is a big deal. I need everyone to fast and pray for me. And that's what they did. I'm going to sing a song that I, I've sung at concerts for a long time now. And I've sung it in a different context. And it's called Somebody's Praying for Me. And it's originally recorded by Ricky Skaggs, country artist. I, I love this song. I, I heard it first on the Gaither vocal um, homecoming videos. Um, but it's talking about somebody's praying for me. And I've always thought of it in the context of my parents, my husband, my daughter, people who have prayed me through things. I wouldn't be up here today without those people. But today when you hear the words, I want you to think about it from Esther's perspective and that she's got all those people out there praying her through and pulling her through this. It's called Somebody's Praying For Me. And I'm gonna use this. praying I can feel it somebody's praying for me mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can see Lord I believe 
Lord, I believe somebody's praying for me. Angels are watching, I can feel them. Angels are watching over me. There's many miles ahead till I get home, still I'm safely kept before your throne. Lord, I still applies to me whether we're talking about Esther or not today um, and I pray for my daughter too every day every day I've been praying for her since I knew of her existence not one day has gone by without praying for her um, the Jewish people did pray for Esther and she got her courage up and she went in three days later to the king and he was actually happy to see her and he should be it had been over a month so he did hold out that scepter, scepter to her and allow her to come forward. And he's like, Esther, whatever you want, up to half of the kingdom, it's yours. Just name it. And she said, well, would you just please come to dinner? And that's, I'll tell you what I would like at dinner. And can you bring Haman? And he's like, well, that sounds like a good idea. We can do that. So the dinner happens. And again, he's like, Esther, tell me what you want. Up to half of the kingdom, you can have it. And she's like, you know... Can we just have this dinner one more time tomorrow night? Can we do it one more time? And Haman, can you come back? Well, of course they both said yes. And Haman's sitting there going, wow, I am so special. Nobody else got asked to come to this dinner. I'm sitting here with the king and the queen, and I'm the only one. I am so important. And he sat there thinking about all the things that he had done and all the wealth that he had amassed. And 
his wonderful sons. He had 10 of them and just everything that was going positive for him. He's like, this is just really wonderful. Sure, I can come back. This next 24 hour period is really kind of crucial to the whole story. So they ate dinner. It's time to go to bed. The king can't go to sleep. He has insomnia. And who knows, what did they eat at <laughs> Beans? Who knows? I don't know why he couldn't go to sleep, but he could not. Maybe it's a God thing, and it probably is. But he could not sleep. And so, you know, what do we do when we can't sleep? We read, we watch TV, we count sheep. Um, king Ahasuerus had one of his workers sit there and read all the royal records for him out loud. That's a lot of records. Okay, and let's keep in mind that Esther really didn't get into the picture for at least three years. So Mordecai and all of that, it's at least three years in. So that man had to have been reading for hours. So they get to the part where Mordecai had saved the king's life by unfolding that assassination plot. And King Ahasuerus like, oh, sits up like, oh my goodness, he saved my life and we never really did anything to honor him. And this is getting into the very early hours of the morning. The sun is starting to come up and he's looking out his window and talking about what can we do? We need to honor this man. And as he's looking out his window, he sees a man out there in the early morning dusk. You can just, he's there. He's like, who is that? Why are they up so early? He said, well, that's Haman. And he said, well, bring him in. You know, he's, a, he's my prime minister, bring him in. And he couldn't wait to ask him, you know, what, what can we do to honor, honor this man? What do we, you know? So Haman walks in and he's like, Haman, what can we do to honor a man that has done something so wonderful for the king? Well, Haman's thinking, oh my goodness, I got to eat with them last night and now he wants to honor me too? This is a big deal. He's like, wow, what? And he had, I was like, let me sit here and think about this for a minute. Hmm, it'd be really cool to get to wear one of your robes. Um, I'd like to ride your horse. And it would be really cool if you got one of your highest officials to parade that person around town and tell everyone about how wonderful he is and how he has brought honor to the king. And the king liked that idea. And so he's like, okay, can you bring Mordecai in? And Haman's like, what do you mean? <laughs> It's supposed to be for me. And he, he said, we need Mordecai in here. We want to honor him because I forgot to do that years ago. So this is a key thing. They did do this little parade around town and he was marched up and down all the streets on this horse with Haman leading the horse and having to do all the, look at this man, he's done something wonderful for the king. That's a key point because Haman had gone there early that morning to tell the king what Mordecai had done. Um, what I forgot to say too is after their little banquet, when Haman went home, full of pride and full of himself, he kind of stumbled over Mordecai on the way, and Mordecai did not bow down once again, and that made him mad. And so when he went home, he told his family, his wife, and he had some friends over. He was telling them all about the wonderful things, but he's like, my day was ruined because Mordecai was out there and he wouldn't bow to me. Like, well, why don't you make a plan to do something about that? You can get rid of him now. You don't have to wait for the decree to come for the end of the year. Let's just do it now. It's like, okay, I'm going to go see the king about this. In the meantime, they built a 75-foot gallows, which is about seven stories high. This is overnight. They did all this. So when he showed up in the king's palace that morning, he was not there to find out how to honor himself. He was there to tell them about Mordecai. But the king got to talk first. So he never got to tell him what he was there for. So here he is parading him around town. It probably took a few hours to get down all the streets. Well, he couldn't possibly go back to the king at this point and say, okay, now we need to walk him back over by the gallows street and hang him because he's not respecting me. He's not bowing down to me. It ruined it. So once he got done marching him through the streets, he just kind of hung his head in despair and went home and told his family about it. And like, you know, this isn't the right time to do it because the king is not going to be, he's not going to say yes. He just had this man honored. He's not going to kill him on the same day. That's all, to me, these are God things that are happening throughout this whole story that I hadn't caught on to as a little girl. So as we're getting to this, um, he's whining about having to walk him through the streets. He didn't have time to come up with another plan. It was time to go back to the banquet again. And that helped him feel a little bit better. He's like, well, 
He may have been paraded down the streets, but he's not getting to sit with the king and queen tonight. I am. And that got his pride back up to kind of where it was before. So he's sitting there at the table, and once again the king has said, Esther, tell me what it is you want up to half the kingdom. He said this three times throughout the whole story. Tell me what you want. You can have half the kingdom. And she finally said, you have put into law that my people are going to be killed. There's going to be a genocide. And, he, and it's going to happen in one day during the last month of the year. And she's like, I, I just want, I, I want to ask you to save my life and save my people. And he's like, well, what do you mean there's this law put in place? And who, who did this? And she pointed to Haman. Well, Haman was mortified. He didn't know she was a Jew. I bet you if he knew she was queen, he would have gone about it a little bit different. It's not that he would have had a different um, outcome, but he might have gone through it differently because he didn't know she was Jewish and she hadn't told him. He didn't ask, so she didn't tell. So they are sitting there talking about this. The bull that made the king mad. He went out for some fresh air and Esther moved to a couch where she could recline. Haman thought, well, I'm, I know I'm going to die for this, so I might as well just one last ditch effort, try and ask Esther to please do something on my behalf. And he sat down on that couch with her as the king came back in, and the king assumed he was trying to take advantage of her. That didn't go over well either. And so he was pulled off of the couch, and he's like, the, the guy who pulled him off of the couch said, did you know he built the gallows for Mordecai? And he said, he said, well, then they're going to get used, but not for Mordecai and I. We're going to hang Haman on those. So they did that. This is all falling into place. And he said, we are going to save your people. But remember when I said that when they made a decree that they could not reverse it? Esther asked again, can you please save my people? And he's like, well, I cannot reverse the order, but I can make a new decree that says they can at least defend themselves. They are allowed to defend themselves. So that's what they did. And even some of the people who were not Jewish helped defend them, and they were spared on that day. Um, Esther's name means star, okay? I want you all to think of yourselves as stars. Some of you may be, not th may be thinking that I'm just not as shiny, and I'm not as brilliant as other people, and I might not be making as big of an impact on others. I heard this quote just this Sabbath at graduation at GCA, and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to share it with you. It's, he was saying, don't you know that stars are always, they always shine the same amount of light, whether it's day or night? It's just a matter of your perspective. So during the day, you can't see them because it's so bright outside, but they're still shining just as bright as they are at night. It's just a matter of perspective. So think of yourself as a star, Think about your impact on somebody or many somebodies. People have asked me many times, why do you do what you do? Why are you going around singing? You have a full-time job already. I'm not, and I do, I'm not bored. But I feel like if I go into a church and sing and one person is changed because of something I said, that's why I go traveling all over the place. It's for, it could be for one person. So maybe your impact might be on one person, it might be on many. And I know some of you have shared things that have happened in your life and even recent. And why has God spared you and brought you here? It's for such a time as this. Keep your eyes open to what he wants you to do. Because it might have an impact on little, it might have an impact on many. But even if it has an impact on one, isn't that worth it? It is to me. I'm going to show you this video that talks about, um, uh, I don't have to do it, he's doing it but it talks about making a difference in people's lives. Um, I wished I could have blue ribbons for you, and if I, I was going to, and I looked at them, they were like $600 for a, a bunch of them, but I was like, $600, that's a lot of money. So we're gonna do this um, in our heads. Think about <laughs> these blue ribbons, and that you've got three of them. And I'm gonna let you listen to this, and we'll talk about it a little more, but if we can do it with the lights off so you can see it, that would be great. Oh, the flags.
A teacher in New York decided to honor each of her seniors in high school by telling them the difference each of them had made. She called each student to the front of the class, one at a time. First, she told each of them how they had made a difference to her and the class. Then she presented each of them with a blue ribbon imprinted with gold letters which read, Who I Am Makes a Difference. Afterwards, the teacher decided to do a class project to see what kind of impact recognition would have on a community. She gave each student three more blue ribbons and instructed them to go out and spread this acknowledgement ceremony. Then they were to follow up on the results, see who honored whom, and report to the class in about a week. One of the boys in the class went to a junior executive in a nearby company and honored him for helping him with his career planning. He gave him a blue ribbon and put it on his shirt. Then he gave him two extra ribbons and said, We're doing a class project on recognition, and we'd like for you to go out, find someone to honor, and give them a blue ribbon. Then give them this extra blue ribbon so they can acknowledge a third person to keep this ceremony going. Then, please get back to me and tell me what happened. Later that day, the junior executive went in to see his boss, who had a reputation of being kind of a grouchy fellow. He told him that he deeply admired him for being a creative genius. The boss seemed very surprised. The junior executive asked him if he would accept the gift of a blue ribbon and give him permission to put it on him. His boss said, well, sure. The junior executive took one of the blue ribbons and placed it right on his boss's jacket above his heart. And then he asked, offering him the last ribbon, would you take this extra ribbon and pass it on by honoring somebody else? The teenager who gave me these is doing a school project and we want to keep this ribbon ceremony going and see how it affects people. That night, the boss came home and sat down with his 14-year-old son. He said, the most incredible thing happened to me today. I was in my office and one of my employees came in and told me he admired me and gave me a blue ribbon for being a creative genius. Imagine, he thinks I'm a creative genius. Then he put a blue ribbon on me that says, who I am makes a difference. He gave me an extra ribbon and asked me to find somebody else to honor. As I was driving home tonight, I started thinking about who I would honor with this ribbon, and I thought about you. I want to honor you. My days are hectic, and when I come home, I don't pay a lot of attention to you. I yell at you for not getting good enough grades and for your messy bedroom. Somehow tonight, I just wanted to sit here and, you know, just let you know that you do make a difference to me. Besides your mother, you are the most important person in my life. You're a great kid, and I love you. The startled boy started to sob and sob, and he couldn't stop crying. His whole body shook. He looked up at his father and said through his tears, Dad, earlier tonight I sat in my room and wrote a letter to you and Mom explaining why I had took my life, and I asked you to forgive me. I was going to commit suicide tonight after you were asleep. I just didn't think you'd care at all. The letter is upstairs. You don't think I'll need it after all. His father walked upstairs and found a heartfelt letter full of anguish and pain. The boss went back to work a changed man. He was no longer a grouch, but made sure to let all of his employees know that they made a difference. The junior executive helped many other young people with career planning, one being the boss's son, and never forgot to let them know that they made a difference in his life. In addition, the young man and his classmates learned a valuable lesson. Who you are does make a difference.
I think they're going to have to be hypothetical ribbons. <laughs> think about three people, or at least one person, that you can give your hypothetical ribbon to and tell them why they have made a difference in, in your life. You know, I think we spend a lot of times today griping about things, and we don't say thank you often enough. And those thank yous go a long way. So think of one person that you can go to today or call on the phone and let them know that and say, okay, I want you to tell somebody else what they've done in your, their life and have it just keep going. You don't have to have a little blue ribbon to make it happen. You can just do it by words. And you have no idea how powerful words can be. As a mother of a 15-year-old, you know, I don't know if the story is true or not, if it was just made for this, but it, I'm sure it's been true a lot of times whether it was done through ribbons or just something that the teachers have said. I kind of like the little background music going. <laughs> oh, I quit. Oh, anyway. <laughs> um, but teenagers, they are vulnerable. They are going through a lot. And I don't think it's been, wow. Let there be light. <laughs> um, I don't think it's been that long ago since I was a teenager, but it has been. And times have changed. And there is more pressure on our kids than ever. Um, they are facing things that you'd never dream of. And even though you raise them right and you're praying every day for them, they still might go down a path that you don't expect them to. So I just, we need to be encouraging them. I know I'm, I'm just feel like standing up here as mom today <laughs> to fight for our kids because they matter. They definitely matter. So just let them know how important they are. But tell somebody today how much they matter. Um, be a star. Be an Esther. Make a difference in somebody's life. Um, I'm gonna, let's bow our heads and we will pray. Dear God, thank you for this day and thank you for helping us um, think about how we have an opportunity to impact others, whether it's a small amount of people or a large amount of people, that you can use us in all of our different capacities. You don't have to be a speaker, or a singer, a teacher a nurse, whatever. You can be whatever it is that you have made us to be and still be able to get that impact out there. So help us to be able to recognize those gifts that you've given us and share with others because um, we, we have just no idea how much even like a little word can mean to someone and can be a life-changing um, thing to them. Maybe make them turn around. We don't know. And we might not even know the impact we have on people until we get to heaven. So help us to realize we don't need to always see the results either, that you know the results and you know the outcome of all of this. So um, thank you for everything you've done for us and help us to be a blessing to those that we come in contact with today. In your name I pray, amen.